Well, the notion of having to undo an outsourcing transaction uh, can be for a variety of different reasons. Um, some are unpleasant. Um, the provider has failed in some form or fashion, and the customer is no longer comfortable with uh, that person as an outsourcing entity. Another thing that could happen is business change, um, dramatic uh, downsizing. Mm -hmm. The cleaving off and selling of a number of divisions has made it so the re resultant final entity is much smaller. There isn't scale. There's not a case for outsourcing. It's just, and as, you, as they evolve the agreement, the parties can't find a common ground. Uh, the economics no longer work. Uh, there's not enough scale, not enough scope. It doesn't feel good to the provider. And there's a mutual understanding in many cases that it's best if we bring it back in-house. Um, and part of uh, the sourcing advisory field is about helping people determine, should I bring it back in-house? The alternative you have to consider, other than bringing it in-house, is is there another provider that I ought to go to? Um, so that's all part of the, uh, the flip side. Rather than outsourcing, it's insourcing. Once someone's brought things back in-house, there could indeed come a time where looking again to the outside for help makes sense. Uh, what would cause that or what would drive that is it get perhaps the inverse of what caused it to come back in-house might be one reason. The company is now accretive. It's now growing. It's now acquiring. It's now become scaled again. And if they were to look to the outside again, uh, they'll, have, they'll be much smarter than they were the first time. Um, anyone who does something for the second time, I mean, we, we, we like to think that um, when you form a sourcing partnership with a provider, it is a lot like being married. Mm -hmm. So I guess if you've, if you've gone through a divorce and you're going to get remarried, you're probably a lot smarter about selecting your second spouse than you were the first time. You know, the, what is the role of the advisor is a question that everyone asks constantly. And the role of the advisor has changed dramatically over the last decade. When you were back in the time when we were doing, think companies were doing this for the first time, they didn't know what to do. And they wanted to do something in a reasonably compressed period of time. And most importantly, the board of directors, the CFO, the chief executive officer wants to be sure that the company is protected and is entering a relevant and appropriate transaction. And that's defined by a lot of things. It's defined by price, by market terms and conditions. All of those things are still there. Even the most sophisticated buyer may have done this three times. Three times, maybe. And I would suggest that if you've done something three times, you're probably not bad. But if you've done something 3,000 times, I suspect you're a little better than you are on the third time. Doesn't take away from the sophistication of procurement organizations in today's clientele. They're there. Uh, but there are many instances where the use of an advisor adds value. It's time to renew the agreement. It's time to dramatically change it one way or another. Um, it's time to assess the relationship feels a little, it doesn't feel broken, but it, it needs some marriage counseling. Uh, bring someone in and help us assess where the relationship has its rub points and how might we mitigate that, how might we fix that. Um, there's so many opportunities still. There's this entire cloud thing coming. You know, what, what, what will cloud be? What will it mean to outsourcing? What will it mean? Is it an inflection point in the future technology? Is it a new way of sourcing things? That entire question of how might I get into the cloud, how might I evaluate the cloud, another phenomenal opportunity for sourcing advisors to help clients think it through. And essentially, we bring a data-driven and fact-based approach to the question of whether to outsource, to whom uh, you might outsource, uh, and how you go about building a deal. When to engage the advisor? Well, in, in the old days, of course, it was up. We're thinking about outsourcing. Actually, we're, we're thinking about whether it would make sense. Should, does it make sense? Let's some, bring someone in and help us figure that out. That's lovely. That's the beginning of strategy and assessment phases. We come in a lot there. But to the point we've made earlier, a lot of people have already done this work. They're in their second or third generation, so they're not at the inception point. They don't need a strategy. They don't need an assessment. Uh, they need help of some type. Uh, a lot of procurement organizations will do that first piece, and they'll go off and they'll create an RFP, and they're about to make a selection, and they suddenly realize they don't really know how to contract for it, and they're in just a little deeper than they want to be. Uh, when is it too late to bring in the advisor? I don't know that it's ever too late. It may be that the advisor comes in and says, listen, we're going to have to back up this bus five miles on the road because we've, we've not done some things we have to do to get this far down the road. Um, it's really never too late. I guess once the transaction's been concluded um, and you're now seeking change management help, that's pretty late. But the fact that you would ask for the help and get the help versus not getting it at all, um, I would say there's prob it's probably never too late. It's optimal to do it earlier, sooner rather than later, but it's probably never too late. A lot of times we're asked uh, to comment on the entire provider landscape. Um, what, what, what has happened to it? What, what do we think of it? Uh, there are a, seri there's a, a series of t uh, types of, of, uh, of providers. 
Uh, there are sort of the United States-based original companies that have become quite global, quite multinational. There's the entire uh, group of pure play Indian providers that have come across the ocean in all directions and are succeeding wildly. Uh, there's been some consolidation. Uh, there probably will continue to be consolidation. Um, several of the, of the players that are independent today are always in the rumor mill and have been for a good 18 months. Um, turns out two of them have already been bought in Pro Systems and, and, and ACS. Uh, there's an entire new class of providers that will come in as this cloud thing gets more momentum. And many of the players are completely new to the space. We'll see Google, we'll see Amazon, people that we just haven't seen. And then there are a lot of new name startups and a lot of those will flame out, but they will create additional consolidation. Whether you have a cloud capability as, a, as a, you know, an Accenture, as an IBM, HP, or Infosys, Wipro, you're going to have to have robust cloud capability at some point because this is going to be an inflection point in the way services and computing and technology is consumed. Um, so that's going to lead to more consolidation and more capability. But we're probably at a reasonable mass of high quality providers in the, what we would call the tier one space. So the cloud is the 2011 uh, sort of uh, subject concept du jour. Uh, what is it? What does it mean? How radically will it change? How fast will it come on? Is it just the flavor of the month and it's going to disappear? I mean, those are all questions that I certainly would not suggest I have the answer to. We are definitely in the more marketing and hype and promise era of the cloud. There are some pretty nice examples of fairly tactical uses of the cloud. Um, if indeed the cloud uh, evolves and grows uh, as some new technologies and disruptive service offerings have in the past, it could become quite, uh, quite integral to the way in which one buys managed services um, at a completely different way than it's done today. I'm not surprised as we think about, you know, a small number of people raising their hands when asked if they're actively using the cloud, that doesn't surprise me. Um, you might see things like Gmail replacing traditional email applications. That's actually pretty easy and you can run a pilot and you know what, if it goes wrong, you can undo it and the likelihood of it going wrong is small. But when we start thinking about big, huge enterprises that have SAP across the globe in 73 locations in 25 countries running production for a, a, a global manufacturer, it's hard to quite envision at the moment how you can cloudify, if you will, something that complex with that many integration points into the rest of the entity. So it's, it's a new concept, like many new concepts, it has to find its way, find its path, uh, but it will have a material impact on the way we consume technology. The question of why is one provider differentiated from the other, be they BPO or otherwise, is, is an interesting one. Um, I, I think that there are certain table stakes if you're a tier one player, be it BPO, ITO, whatever it might be, there's a certain things you have to ante into the game to be considered. If you don't have methodology, if you don't have process, if you don't have ITIL standards, if you don't have capability that's robust, global reach, all of those things, you're not in the game. So once you're all in the game and you're playing poker, now why does one player win more than the other and what attracts you? And I think a lot of times it's the cultural alignment, it's the brand, it's the philosophies and the principles that you feel, so it's not all quantitative, that you feel as you go through the process of evaluating multiple providers. One of the advantages of looking at multiple providers is you get to see that. You get to feel the difference, the subtlety, the nuance, and there are some distinct differences. It might be that one has a particular investment and has gone deep and long on a certain technology that's very germane to your business. Another happens to be the retail expert. For whatever the reason, they win more retail than they lose, they're kind of the retail guru. Another one might be the BPO, F&A outsourcing expert. So it's a matter of what lines up with you and what your business needs are, and then finding the one that might have the edge in that area. But at the tier one level, they're all very capable. Performing the basic things, they can all do it. So you should be able to make a good decision. The question is, how do you make the best decision?